You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Oh, hi everyone. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com. Welcome to episode 342 of the Corbett Report podcast, Pricking the Filter Bubble. Well, story time. So get yourself a coffee, relax. This is going to be a bit of a long story, but it'll be worth it in the end. So as you may or may not know, last year in the Summer Truth Music playlist video, and speaking of which, I guess it's about time for the next Summer Truth Music playlist, so get your suggestions in. But I uh, featured Vinny Caggiano, a.k.a. Vin Cognito, on YouTube, who I found doing some Beatles musical analysis, although he does music theory generally, but I, I discovered him through his Beatles analysis, and I played a little bit of that in the, the Summer Truth Music video last year because I found his analysis fascinating, and uh, we got to talking. We were both on the Ripple Effect podcast, uh, talking about music conspiracy and things like that for a couple of times. And uh, one thing led to another, and I started getting Skype guitar lessons from him. I did do guitar lessons back when I was around 18 years old for a few months, enough to learn the chords and bar chords and what have you, but just starting to dip my toe into, okay, now let's learn these scales and you learn a little bit of theory, and at that time I was just like, I don't want to do that, that's too much work, so I kind of gave up, and I remained at the same level of guitar ability for the next uh, two decades or so. So, fast forward to quite recently, in the last several months, I started taking guitar lessons once again, this time from Vinny, uh, Vinny Caggiano, Vin Cognito. Uh, excellent Skype guitar lessons, by the way, if you're interested. Uh, and so we're just going through the type of music theory stuff that I didn't care about at all when I was 18. Now I'm suddenly interested in it. Funny how life works. So I've been noodling around on guitar quite a bit more than I have in the last couple of decades, and uh, recently I came up with this little chord progression, which I kind of like. As always, when I come up with a chord progression that I think sounds good, I always think to myself, so who did I rip this off from? Because clearly I didn't do that myself. <laughs> and interestingly, the song that came to mind that that reminds me of was High and Dry by Radiohead. And I say interestingly because in my entire life up to that point, I'd probably heard that song maybe five times ever in my life, and certainly not within the last few years. So why on earth did I suddenly start subconsciously copying that? I don't know. But uh, here's the point, and here's where things get interesting. I know you're thinking, what the hell does this have to do with the price of tea in China? Well, here's where things get interesting. I hadn't heard that song very much in my life because I've been on a Radiohead boycott for the last couple of decades. Long story short, back when OK Computer first came out and everyone was telling me, this is the best album that's ever been created. These guys walk on water. Oh, this is amazing. You've got to listen to this, James. And I listened to OK Computer. And yeah, there's some great songs on there, but it wasn't exactly the second coming of Christ like I'd been promised by the indie hipster crowd. So I decided, eh, I think this is a bit overhyped. I'm going to step back. So for two decades, that's exactly what I did. I, of course... I mean, like everyone else, you hear the singles, you hear the big hits, you hear things here and there, so I have heard Radiohead, but I haven't listened to an album of theirs at any rate since OK Computer. And so it's very odd that I'm playing this chord progression and I suddenly think of this Radiohead song that I barely heard in my entire life. But I was in the conundrum. Of course, I didn't own any Radiohead albums, so and I don't have Spotify or Apple Music or any streaming service like that, so what do you do in a position like that? You go to ThemTube to look up the music video, of course, right? So that's exactly what I did. I went to ThemTube, I looked up the music video, and uh, yeah, the chord progression for the verse on uh, High and Dry is something like... Uh so 
So, <laughs> not exactly the same. Uh, it's essentially an F sharp minor with the open B and E strings, an A sus two, and then an E with the E sus four. <laughs> not exactly the same as my progression, uh, musically speaking. I had a, a four two one um, with a little s suspension on the one, and uh, Radiohead has a, a two four one with a little suspension on the one. So. <laughs> Highly reminiscent, we'll say. And I, yeah. So now I can't play that original progression without thinking of high and dry, even though it's not technically the same thing. But uh, that's, this is where things start to get creepy, interesting, something. So here I am on my Radiohead boycott, and I look, I go to them too, I type in high and dry, I watch the Radiohead video, I suss out the chords, and yeah, okay, it's, yeah, I see, you know, it's kind of subconscious plagiarism or something going on there. At any rate, it reminds me too much of that song, so I don't think I'll ever do anything with that chord progression. But, as a result of me going to you, Vemtube and typing in Radiohead High and Dry and watching the video, of course, the GooTube decides that I must be interested in Radiohead, right? So it starts recommending videos for me. And I see them on the sidebar in the recommended videos, but, eh, you know, I, I'm on my boycott. I don't care. But, to be fair, I've always, even during my Radiohead boycott, I've always maintained, yes, of course, Radiohead has the best music videos of any band ever. Uh, Just is the best music video ever made, hands down. And uh, I love most of their music videos. So, you know, I'd see, oh, there's Just, oh, I'll watch Just. Oh, there's Karma Police. Uh, that's a good one. I'll watch that one. And, of course, since I click on that one and I click on that one, well, now ThemTube thinks I really want to hear Radiohead. So now it's recommending more Radiohead to me. And I, for the most part, again, I'm on my boycott. I'll watch a video here and there, but eh, I, don't, I don't really care. Until I kept getting this one recommendation for this video, and I don't remember the title off the top of my head, so I'll put it on screen for those of you watching the video. I'll put the link in the show notes, as always, in case you're interested. But it was something like the rhythmic illusion behind Radiohead's videotape. Videotape, although I didn't know it at the time, being the last uh, track on their 2007 In Rainbows album. And I saw that recommended to me over and over, and I thought that sounded interesting enough. What the rhythmic illusion, what, what on earth, what is going on here? So I click on it. It's a Vox video, of all things, an earworm video. Uh, it's this 10-minute video about videotape. For those who've never heard it, I mean, it's it sounds exceptionally simple. It's just... Da, 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 da. And if you were to ask anyone on, in the world to count that song, they would go, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But that's not how Radiohead is playing it. That's not how they're hearing it in their heads as they're playing it. There's a rhythmic displacement going on of one eighth note. Anyway, it's intriguing. It's absolutely intriguing to me. So I start, I watch the 37 minute video that the, some crazy Super Radiohead fan did that was the basis for that Vox video. And I watched many of the live performances of videotape and I listened to the studio version and suddenly I could hear, oh wow, there's this whole uh, different dance beat thing going on in the background that you would never know. Oh, that's and I decided, you know what? That's that's actually genius. I have to hand it to them. That is that is really genius the way they did that. And once you get, go down that rabbit hole, it's fascinating. So, long story short, I'm now, yeah, okay, all right. I'm a Radiohead fan. <laughs> I've broken the two decade boycott. I've bought most of their albums. Uh, yeah, I yeah. You can't deny that a lot of what they do is genius. I still think they're overrated. I still think people hype them too much and. Anything they ever do is genius. Well, no, but they do have enough genius songs in their repertoire that I'll hand it to them. Now, this may not seem earth-shatteringly significant, but it means something, doesn't it? Here I am on this two-decade-long boycott of Radiohead. What is going to break that boycott? A GooTube algorithm that recommends videos to me? And... Oh, well, that one seems interesting. I'll just look at that. Oh, wow, that's really interesting. I'll get more into that. I'll get more into that. Suddenly, next thing you know, I'm buying all their albums and, and watching all these different videos. That that means something. And, yeah, it's whether or not James listens to Radiohead, who cares? But could it be that this process is taking place about more fundamentally important issues, too? There's a TEDx talk that you gave 
that I very much appreciated. You talk about your awakening there in Japan. Can I have you give a, a short version of things? What were the first things that made you say, wait a second, this doesn't fit in with what my worldview is and what led to your awakening? Well, my awakening, as it's called, um, which is a problematic term in a lot of ways, but I'm assuming at least some of your audience can uh, it sounds, relate to sounds that Sounds like we're, cult we're cultish, aren't we? Yeah, it With does sound awakening. a bit cultish, doesn't it? But so, there so, is so tell a us real about phenomenon. your step into the light. Well, there, there is a real phenomenon that happens when people start encountering some very unusual information, information they truly didn't expect, and it can be very disorienting at first. So I think... A lot of people can probably relate to that. And my experience with that happened in 2006. So basically, I was in Japan. I was teaching English. The furthest thing from my mind was starting a website, getting involved in anything like this. I had absolutely no intention to do so. But I moved into a new apartment here in Japan. And this apartment came with an internet connection. It would be the first time I'd had internet in my apartment for years. So I suddenly had internet. And hey, I could just sit and browse at, at home at my leisure. And there's all these nifty new services that have popped up in the meantime, like, like YouTube, like Google video. These were brand new things um, back in 2006. So I was, I was doing what I tended to do. Hey, I like to watch documentaries. I like to, to find out information. Hey, I think I'll, I can watch pretty much anything I want that's, as long as it's on YouTube or Google video. And at that time it was the wild west. So everything was on YouTube and Google video. So it was, uh, it was, great for me. I was learning all sorts of new stuff, but I kept getting these related videos recommended to me in the sidebar about 9-11 conspiracy stuff. And I thought, oh, no, uh, I just I didn't even want to hear it. I didn't want to see it. That's stupid. It's ridiculous. Look, I know there's conspiracies and things that happen, but 9-11, that's that's just ridiculous. Once in a while, I'd click out of one of them just out of morbid curiosity or just to, to laugh at the st stupidity of it. And to be fair, there were some stupid videos being promoted about flying orbs and things like this. But every once in a while, there'd be a clip from a documentary or something that caught my attention. And I thought, well, that's that cannot be the case. I, I can't believe that. And I go and look up the little no nugget of information. There's no way official story. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I'd go and look up this little nugget of information that was being told to me in a documentary and I'd find, Oh my God, there's actual proof of it. For example, operation Northwoods. There was this plan that went through the, the joint chiefs of staff were sitting there on the president's desk in 1962, waiting to be signed. That was an, whole series of events that were going to be staged in order to justify an invasion of Cuba. They were talking about uh, sinking ships or t taking down airliners or starting terrorist incidents, blowing things up, killing people in Washington, D.C. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, the, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff signed off on this and it was waiting for Kennedy's signature. Kennedy didn't sign it. And so it never went ahead. But it's very interesting, that little piece of history and how we don't get taught that in school, um, even though it's been been known about for a couple of decades at this point. Anyway, it's been declassified. So um, that was the kind of information that I started to find. And I started to go, well, that I, I didn't know that. I didn't hear that on the nine o'clock news or, or uh, sometimes there even was things that were, were literally on the mainstream news that just kind of got memory hold somehow. Like, uh, oh yeah, Osama bin Laden was in Raul Pindi in a military hospital on the night before 9-11. 100%. The uh, the U.S. military and intelligence services knew where Osama bin Laden was on the night before 9-11. And yet, somehow, he got away. And then Tora Bora, and he somehow got away. What, what's going on here? So the more I started to dig into it, basically, it was the snowball that was rolling downhill. Uh, once you start trying to search this information in order to disprove it, and you have a tough time disproving it, you start getting into that process. And it was really just, you know, it was just a process that kept going. And I started finding out the Federal Reserve and the monetary system, and things along that those lines. And by that point, I guess I was ready to uh, start my own website to, to continue the research for myself and do it in a very public fashion. Oh, that's right. In some non-trivial way, to some non-trivial extent, you could say that the YouTube recommended video algorithm is, if not entirely responsible, at least a contributing factor to the fact that the Corbett Report exists at all. What could come along and break down my two decade long blockade against Radiohead? What could break down my five year, at that point, five year long blo uh, bro boycott against 9-11 truth information? It was 
YouTube, GooTube, and their recommended video algorithm. Again, that's not to say I never could have or would have encountered this information in any other form if, if it hadn't have been for GooTube, but there it is. That is what actually was one of the dominoes to fall on the path to starting the Corporate Report podcast in the first place. Now, feel free to come up with your own conspiracy theory about why, well, why was ThemTube recommending these types of videos in the first place? And maybe the 9-11 truth is a, is a psyop designed to get people fighting the government or something. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever your theory is, that's fine. I personally think that they just did not have the algorithms refined to the extent that they do today, and we're not as actively aware of and utilizing them to shape public opinion as they admittedly are today. I mean, they talk about it openly now, talking, talking about different ways that they can adjust algorithms to get people accurate, accurate and trustworthy information rather than this conspiracy nonsense. I mean, back in the day before, before GooTube was even Google, uh, I mean, I, would, I am probably thinking of the brief window of time when YouTube was still actually YouTube and not a Google property. Um, they were probably just trying to get people to click on videos. I mean, that was the, the main purpose of it. And there are certain negative aspects to that as well, but not quite as nefarious as manipulating, trying to manipulate people's worldview and perception and what information they have access to, like social engineers. And so, of course, this raises the question, well, if the uh, them tube search uh, recommended video algorithm can suggest certain things or put certain videos or certain information in front of you, then doesn't that mean by the corollary is it can do the opposite. It can prevent you from seeing certain important information, can't it? Your short nine, uh, video 9-11 conspiracy theory made six year, years ago is nowhere to be found on the YouTube search engine. It has almost three million views and yet nothing. I've scrolled one mile and still nothing. But there is a channel, Global Research TV, that uploaded the original video mentioning you with that same thumbnail of George Bush and counts only 90k views. Your video is not deleted. It's on your channel. I know YouTube censors videos, but to make it completely disappear from the search engine is really odd. Yes, it is really odd. Thank you for pointing that out, Marino. And in fact, this is something that I noticed a couple of years ago, uh, I can't remember exactly when, but it's been at least a couple of years, maybe a few years, I noticed it was getting harder and harder for me to search that video when I just wanted to look it up on YouTube and instead of going through my creator studio backend thing, just looking in the search engine, 9-11 and conspiracy theory, it was getting harder and harder. Like it would be the, the 12th result and then it'll be on like the second page of results. And then I'd have to put it in quotation marks. So it was that exact phrase. I get it. 9-11 conspiracy theory is kind of... Uh, it was purposefully a very general title that could have, you know, millions of results. But you would think, again, this viral video, millions of views on my channel, millions of views combined on other people's channels, hundreds of thousands of uh, downloads directly from my website. You would think that this would be higher in the search ranking. But no, it was it was getting pushed progressively further and further down the search results. And now, yeah, now I've heard from you and uh, Brock West uh, was just letting me know this today and other people have uh, pointed it out. And I myself, too, you cannot search that video on YouTube anymore. You put in the exact title, you put in quotation marks, you do whatever, you even put Corbett or Corbett Report next to it. You cannot get that video from the search bar anymore. This is, a, this is a type of censorship I think most people don't even know is happening right now. I mean, we all know the searches are being structured and whatever, but you literally cannot search this video anymore. Um, at least as far as I, I mean, I've tried everything. I cannot find it in the search bar anymore. It's still there. It's still on my channel. It's still up there, but they do not want you to find it, interestingly. But with that video and with a lot of my other videos, it is posted everywhere, all sorts of different channels. And you'll find, I think, Probably everyone knows it as the 9-11 in five minutes video, and that's what everyone calls it, although that's not the title. You search that, I'm pretty sure that one's still up. That was one of the other people who uploaded it. Global Research uploaded it. Many people have uploaded in many locations, and that's why it is good to have multiple people uploading these things all over the place, because they can censor me, and they have, and they do, but they can't censor everyone and adjust the algorithm for everyone. Well, maybe that's coming that later down the line, but at this point... That's probably the only way that video is being disseminated, other than people sending the direct links to other people. It's probably um, other uploads of it that's being found in the search bar right now. 
and maybe being recommended. I don't know if that video is, ever shows up in anyone's recommended videos. So it's interesting. And that's, of course, precisely why I've been screaming my head off about creating all and supporting alternative social media structures for years now. And that's why people like Ray Vahi heard my call and started BitChute.com. And, you know, th this is extremely important. This truly is the foundation of everything. I don't care what you believe or don't believe or what conspiracy you're into or not into. If you, if uh, without these, the ability to use and access these platforms, we don't even understand how our view of the world is being shaped because you can't know what you're not finding in the search bar. And this is an example of it. Hey guys, type 9 11 conspiracy theory into the search bar, you won't find my YouTube video. What other things are being truly censored from the search bar? You don't know. You can't know. And what you can't know won't ever affect what you think, and you'll never encounter that information. So think about that, and uh, that's exactly why we need social media alternatives. Remember that social media alternative series I was doing that was deeply, wildly unpopular? <laughs> Greeted with rank unenthusiasm from the crowd, and if not, outright scorn and vitriol? <laughs> well, anyway, this is why we need to explore many, many, many alternatives. We need to create many other platforms, and we need to stop giving ThemTube all our power. Yes, as I say, when I go to YouTube and I try to search 9-11, a conspiracy theory, the video, no matter what search terms I'm using, I don't get it on the first page of my results. Now, I want to thank all the people who have uh, written me to say different ways that they have found the uh, video on their through their searches. And some people are saying, well, if you just go to Google or if you go to DuckDuckGo or if you go to start page or some other search engine and type it in. Yeah, I understand that. I'm talking about the not, uh, the YouTube search engine itself. If you go to the YouTube search engine and are searching this information, it seems, at least for me, it doesn't seem to offer it to me. Um, other people say otherwise. And that is part of this problem, is that the filter bubble is not some one-size-fits-all solution for everyone. No, each of us has our own individually tailored filter bubbles because the the algorithms know what you've searched for in the past, what you've clicked on in the past, what you, what information you tend to want to see and tend to not want to see, and it calculates all of that and gives you your search results. So try searching the same search term from someone else's computer and see if you get the exact same list of items. I mean, this is this is part of the problem. We don't even know the extent to which information is being precluded from us and not other people and what have you. I mean, this is this is such a deeper and more complex issue than uh, most people give it credit for, but it's even deeper than that. Because let's just give benefit of the doubt and say that this is, th th these recommended algorithms and tailored news feeds and everything are working perfectly fine and in an even-handed manner and are not trying to manipulate your worldview and prevent you from seeing certain information and forcing certain other information into your your uh, consciousness, which they are. But let's just pretend for a moment that's not doing that. And these recommended algorithms and tailored news feeds and everything are just working as they're supposed to function to basically give you more of the content you want to see and less of the content you don't want to see. That in and of itself is a problem. It creates a societal problem that we are starting to experience now because as I was talking recently on financial survival, I brought up the point that we are living it cocooned in ideological filter bubbles. Bubbles, these these bubbles, most, or if not mostly, at least largely of our own making, because we, well, of course, you just want to hear from people that you agree with. You want to hear the things that you already agree with. Well, you now have the ability to do that in a way that was not possible in any other era. Yes, you could, back in the day, you could try to avoid you know, the New York Times and try to read the Wall Street Journal or something. But then, even then, of course, your options are highly limited and you're still going to be bumping up against information you don't like and viewpoints that you don't want to hear from. Well, today you can absolutely, you can subscribe to only the people you want to hear. You can, you can have super incredibly niche little information markets where you only ever co correspond with people in the echo chamber. And that is contributing to the hyperpolarization of society that none of us can deny is taking place right now. Tonight in Chicago, a college campus suddenly erupted. 
police and protesters doing battle because political tensions have reached a boiling point. Tough words from Berkeley's mayor about the army of anarchists who took over a peaceful rally while others are defending their violent tactics. Jeff Sessions. Let's go. Jeff Sessions. Let's go. Jeff Sessions. Let's go. Just look now, you might see the police are in the distance. You've got some of what are known as being the black locks here in France. They are covered with their faces. That's because they don't want to be identified. And you might be able to see that they are throwing items towards the police. <laughs> I hope the scope of the problem that we're dealing with here today is not lost on the viewers and listeners. I mean, this is a huge issue. It has to do with the, the information that's being presented to us in the first place because of the behind the scenes wizardry of the algorithms deciding you should see this or you shouldn't see that. But also, it comes from our own volition of wanting to see certain information, not wanting to see others, and hyper-tailoring information for ourselves. We tailor our own news feeds to make sure that we only ever hear from the viewpoints that we agree with. And as I say, this is leading to the polarization, which is accounting for the complete dehumanization of the other. In fact, we're going through a transition right now that is part of the whole process of uh, the the internetwork networking of humanity through the cyberspace i mean all of these trendy catchwords you've been he hearing about for decades is coming to fruition in the changing the transitioning of society from one that is based on communities that are geographically structured you live in geographical proximity to these people so you share certain experiences and certain common cultural understandings and certain a language and all of these things let alone certain ideological perspectives that people in geographical proximity tend to share we're going from that to ideological communities that are not geographically based and that you could have more in common with someone in Timbuktu than you do your next door neighbor. In fact, you might know the person in Timbuktu's name. You might not know your neighbor's name. This is a dramatic, incredible transition that's taking place right now. And it leads to this hyper-partisanship and this hyper-polarization and ultimately the dehumanization of others, the other online and increasingly in the real world because as the poles start to get pushed apart and you are either alt right or you are alt left and there is no space in the middle you've got to choose a side and suddenly you choose a side and then everything that is not you is the other and is this horrible evil force that must be stopped it is the reason for the destruction of society this is the divide and conquer in, to an extent that I don't, well, we certainly haven't seen in our lifetimes, and I would posit we haven't seen anything quite like this in history before. Um, and it is being, that wedge is being driven deeper and deeper and deeper, and I've talked about it before. The question is, is there any space for us with our volition and our knowledge of these things to do anything about this? Or is this just all being constructed by algorithms behind the scenes and we're just hapless participants? Well, or spectators, I should say. Well, as you know from everything I ever say on The Corporate Report, no, we are not ever just helpless spectator, spectators that are just passively receiving all of this. We do have an active part to play in helping to shape the world around us, including shaping the bubbles that we live in. I, I don't think you can ever escape living in some form of bubble, uh, however crudely designed that may be and however broad it may be. But yes, we, we cannot process all information that is coming through the entire world at the same time. Obviously, we have to select what to look at and what not to look at and who to talk to and who not to talk to. There is selection that goes on. You cannot avoid that. But if it's done consciously and for certain ends and in a certain way and in a certain fashion that you model certain behaviors, you can start to change certainly your own world and by broader implication, the world of those around you. 
Uh, this is an important topic. So let's go to something that I was talking about recently on the podcast. I was talking about uh, the Econ Talk podcast hosted by Russ Roberts and saying that often has interesting discussions. Well, apropos, just in the past week, Russ Roberts, as I was preparing this podcast, also came out with his own podcast talking about uh, filter bubbles and online experience and how, how we can help to shape the discourse that we want to see in the world. So let's listen to a clip from that recent uh, edition of Econ Talk. So I want to now suggest what I think we can actually do, both as individuals and perhaps in groups, to uh, to make things better. And I, I don't want to pretend this is going to be. Don't don't get your hopes up. You know, this is not going to be like uh, this fabulous list of suggestions. They're quite modest, as you'd expect. Um, you know, it's like uh, you know, we, we got to do something. Well, I don't. No, we don't. Uh, what we have to do probably is something that actually is good. That would be my first rule. Not we have to do something. We have to do something that's good. We have to do something that actually makes the problem better, improves things. So that, that's always my um, course rule of thumb. So first thing, not surprisingly, for longtime listeners, I would suggest humility. We don't know everything we think we do. Uh, I've learned to enjoy saying I don't know. Admitting ignorance is bliss. Recognize as Shakespeare suggested, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy. That's not so easy. And as I've alluded to in a few times in recent conversations, humility's got its own risks, which if things really are going badly, you, you don't want to be humble. You, you got to be passionate. So you don't want just the certain people to be passionate. You do want some of the humble people to be passionate. If you're, if you're always saying, I don't know, you tend not to be very proactive. So that, that's a genuine concern. It's an issue I'm going to, I'm sure, be returning to now and then, um, inevitably. But that's a real problem, um, both of those things. We're too arrogant, so we need to be more humble, but we also have to keep in mind that there may be some things that are generally danger, genuinely dangerous, and we can't just sit on the sidelines and say, who, who knows? There are some things we know, um, so we should stand by our principles, but we should be humble and aware of the possibility that some of those principles may not be correct. Second piece of advice is uh, to follow people on Twitter or Facebook who don't agree with you. Try to find folks who are relatively civil. That may be unrealistic. They just may make you matter. So if you follow people on Twitter and Facebook who are different from you, instead of getting educated, you might just get angry. So that's um, – not the best solution, perhaps, but it's a thought. Uh, the third is to hold your anger for a day, a wonderful expression, um, which I'm a big fan of. Don't ratchet up the rhetoric. Do your part to bring more civilization and more civility to social media. Don't answer emails with from strangers who hate your guts with the same kind of angry rhetoric. Answer people calmly. Don't play the game. Don't lower yourself. I think that's really um, just good advice generally, not just for this issue, but just for one's own sanity and soul. Uh, fourth, spend less time on the internet, more time with human beings. It's easier said than done, especially for young people. But if you can't quit, take a day off, a Sabbath from Discord. I think that's a great idea if you can handle it. And uh, the fifth is try to notice when you enjoy outrage. Just just be aware of the fact that you ha may have that personality trait. I think many of us do. That when you find yourself feeling um, the sweetness of that anger – to realize that that's a very unhealthy emotion and that it's um, – you should keep an eye on it. Like so many of the topics that we talk about here, there are aspects of this filter bubble phenomenon that we can't control. Uh, we can't control what the GooTube or Twitter or – Facebook or any of these other algorithms are recommending to us or suggesting to us or tailoring our news feeds or tailoring our search results so we see certain things and not other things. We can't, we can't even know about that, really, let alone control that in any meaningful sense. Um, but there are things that we can do to take some of our control back. And I, as Russ Roberts points out there, I, I think there are a number of things that I agree with about what he's saying there. One of the things we can choose to do is we can choose not to put ourselves in a filter bubble in the first place, or at least not, not to put ourselves in a bubble, an ideological bubble or shell in the first place. And I would just like to put the, the thought out there, the challenge to everyone who's listening to this, including myself, out of all the podcasts you subscribe to or the RSS feeds that you follow or the, the, the video channels that you subscribe to, 
How many of them are the ones that you're not in ideological alignment with? Are you 100% and only following and subscribing to voices that you agree with, talking about topics you already, uh, already have your mind set on that are only ever going to say the things you want to hear? If so, then you yourself are helping to put yourself in that bubble. You're creating the bubble around you. And it behooves us all to have at least some input from something outside of the echo chamber. That's why, for example, I've featured Listening to the Enemy as one of the, uh, the series on this podcast. It is important that you're listening to whatever it is. In the Corbett Report context, it's you know the CFR and things like that, to at least understand what is being said on that side of the aisle, but also to, if you're on the left, you should listen to people on the right. If you're on the right, you should listen to people on the left. And again, it doesn't mean that you have to agree with things. It's ha so that you can learn how to disagree and what to disagree about. If you're only ever seeing the caricature of the other side from your own side, then you will never truly experience human interaction. Uh, we are losing key elements of society because we can so fundamentally cocoon ourselves in the bubble. So try subscribing and following and whatever to some voices that you disagree with, just so you can try to get the other side. Uh, again, if you dehumanize the other side of any debate to the point where oh, oh, only shills or, or people who are, you know, deep state agents could possibly believe this other thing, then I think you're doing a disservice to yourself. Another thing that we can choose to do, we can choose well, ultimately, we can choose not to use these services at all. We can choose to turn off the internet, at least more often. <laughs> I mean, we can choose to pop the bubble because you can't, they can't control reality in the same way that they can control the online space and tailor your news feeds and all of that. So stepping outside of that altogether. Another fundamentally important aspect of this is that we can choose how we relate to other people online and off. But I think this is particularly important online because this is where our perception of social interaction is in increasingly taking place. We are increasingly becoming a society of people who have been steeped in internet culture to the point where we think that the internet online interactions that we have are indicative of the interactions we're supposed to have in the world. That's dangerous and ridiculous because, of course, people do not act the same way online as they do in real life and face-to-face -face conversations, but we're losing, uh, to a certain extent, we're losing our ability dif to differentiate that. And, of course, online, it's hatred, it's vitriol, it's trolling, it's getting in people's face, it's saying things you would never say to a real human being in a real conversation. It's about being the loudest, the noisiest, the most arrogant wins the conversation online. And that, of course, is leading us to a very bad place where it is about divide and conquer. We are dividing and conquering ourselves by the way that we interact with the other, other people and the way we model those interactions for other people. The more people who adopt the online troll mentality, the more people out there will see that as the societal standard, the norm, and it will be a contagion. Well, we have to, to the extent we can, all we can do is affect ourselves, but we have to model the discourse we want to see in the world, civilly engaging with people, even people who disagree with us. Or if they have shown that they do not, that they will not civilly engage with us, then civilly disengage with them and don't feed the trolls, don't feed into the beast and perpetuate the vicious outrage cycle because it is leading in a very bad direction. And... Again, there are certain things we cannot control, but there are certain things that are in our power to control. And there's no easy solution here. We, we are changing fundamentally as a society because of these technologies, these communication technologies that open up the space for discourse like the Corbett Report and other things that I'm sure you value online. But also it brings with it the polarization, the vitriol, the hatred, taking us to a place where I imagine most of us do not want to go. So... It's something to think about. I think this is an important topic. I know it's not going to be uh, the most uh, pressing topic for a lot of people out there or they don't see the importance of it, but I guarantee you at some point my reflections here today will come back to you as you uh, participate in the online culture and find yourself in one bubble or another. That's going to do it for today. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com. Looking forward to talking to you again very soon.
The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com slash support. Two jumps in a week, I bet you think that's pretty clever. Don't you, boy?